So good morning, good morning, good morning. I had such a wonderful time preparing for this event because I haven't taught lobbying since probably 2016. So back in 2016, when I was literally on Capitol Hill every week running a lobbying team, um, we would do these trainings. And so what I'm going to be doing right now is I am going to share what I learned in roughly, oh, 15 years as a Hill lobbyer or lobbyist on health care, voting rights, economics and social justice, the Equal Rights Amendment, and a number of other things. So everybody, welcome, 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 and thank you for joining us for our How to Be an Effective Citizen Lobbyist, because that is what you're going to be. As Geoma said, there's not any money for, for you or us at this level, but we have the ability to change the world. Today's agenda. Um, uh, we'll do some introductions and then uh, that will be of your facilitators. And then this is what we're going to be going through. The art of lobbying. Lobbying is both an art and a science. We'll then be going through the science of lobbying. And as part of that science, we're going to look at online tools, which is where you're going to do your research for what, who are the best legislators to target. Uh, we even target the unlikely ones. And then we're going to look at advocacy tools. And then I will introduce you to Lobbying 202, where you will either go get your own lobbying tools or you will work with us utilizing a lot of the technology that we have in our shop. Your facilitators today will be me, yours truly, and Josie, and we will be working to make sure this is a learning experience where at the end of our time together, you will feel ready to go out, get your issue written into a bill and get that bill passed. Me, I'm the founding board member. I am the policy director. I've been a federal lobbyist from 2010 to 2019. I suppose I still am, but since 2019, I've been working full time on voting rights. Actually, I am still lobbying. I lobby with my faith groups. I am the working group chair of Democracy and Governance of the Virginia Green New Deal Coalition. And way back when in 2008, I was the Democratic nominee for the Virginia 4th District. Josie is the deputy policy director of Center for Common Ground. It is Josie who works on the legislative priorities at the federal level and the state level. So when Josie goes to policy meetings, frequently she's meeting with groups that are based in DC. Frequently these days, she's meeting with groups that are based in Arizona and Texas. And so you may have heard about a lot of the bad bills that were passed even in Georgia, but due to the work that Josie was able to do utilizing our advocacy tools, those bills were not as bad as they could have been. And I have one more member of my team here, gonna give a shout out 
to Justin in Massachusetts. Justin is the liaison between our policy team where a lot of the policy documents are written and then our phone bank team where the volunteers get on the phone, call voters in the impacted states and basically tell them what their legislators are doing and give them the opportunity to get patched directly through to their legislators and tell them what they think of what they're doing. So thank you, Josie, for all that you do and Justin. Our sponsors today are Center for Common Ground and the Virginia Green New Deal. So shout out to Natalie, who is the education and outreach coordinator for that working group of the Virginia Green New Deal. Now, lobbying, this is what you came here for, lobbying. In D.C., there are over 30,000 paid lobbyists who visit D.C. Most of the paid lobbyists are going to be earning five, generally six-figure incomes to go and convince legislators in D.C. to do their bidding. That's part of the problem in D.C. and why you see people behaving in such ridiculous fashion. Corporations have a lot of money, literally billions of dollars, to pay normally attorneys to go and try to get legislators to do what they want. Um, one of the important things about what we do is a paid lobbyist is one person and they represent maybe a very small group of corporate power brokers. We as citizens, if and when we do it right, we represent real people, real voters. Now, as hard as many of you may find this to believe, Money and votes aren't really the same thing. Corporations aren't really people, even though for the moment they've legally managed to get themselves declared to be one and the same. What we have to take away as citizens is lobbying works. If it didn't, why would corporations invest billions of dollars in it? Lobbying works. We, the people, just have to go out and do it. And I'm going to give you two ways in this course that you can do it. We can't all go to D.C. and we can't all run to D.C. every month. And that is also true of our state house. That's why we have digital tools where we can send an email, we can make a phone call, we can reach out to those legislative offices once a month, once a week. And I might even have Justin to tell you about our once a day tool where we can reach out to the legislators. It is our responsibility to let our elected officials know and understand our agenda. Legislators need educating. They don't know everything. When I was teaching lobbying from about 2010 to 2016, we actually called our program Educate Congress. Now, the whole idea of lobbying is that you're working to influence, persuade, you're bringing pressure on the electeds to do what you want. Now, lobbying only works if it is consistent and persistent. So I know a lot of organizations have a lobby day you show up once a year. If that's all you do, 
you're not even close. That is not what it's going to take. Your consistency is that you show up once a year, but you're missing the persistent part. That's where petitions and digital outreach can come in. We work with people in Educate Congress to those of us who were near DC, we would go to DC. We had everybody else lobby their elected representatives at home. All right, consistent and persistent. Now, who are the best lobbyists in the world? I guarantee you, we all know probably more than one. The best lobbyists in the world are children. When a child wants something and they've made up their mind that they really want it, you cannot get them to stop talking about it, agitating for it until they get it. We have to learn from the little lobbyist that while it's irritating and they're the fly in the ointment in our cereal and in our coffee, it really does work. Um, I'm not going to make you answer, but one of the questions that I would normally ask when we were in person is, how many people have ever told a child you weren't going to give them something or let them do it? And then eventually you gave in and whatever it was they wanted, they got. Normally when people are being honest, every hand in the room quietly goes up. Consistency and persistence pays off. Now, who can lobby? Everybody can lobby. Periodically, I hear people saying, oh, we're a 501c3, so we can't lobby. That's not true. The people who work for a 501c3, you didn't give up your citizenship when you went to work for that organization. A 501c3, even as an organization, can lobby their elected representatives. They are just limited in the amount of money we can spend on the lobbying. Normally it's 15% of whatever your annual budget is, but 501c3s can lobby. I am part of a group called Faithful Democracy. And one of the things that we do is we lobby Republican legislators on voting rights. Talk about something that is sort of not fun, but because we are faith people, what legislator wants it said, oh, you wouldn't talk to faith people. Now, again, it's our responsibility as citizens. If rich corporations are sending people to Washington and their state capitals and our city and county councils, then we have to be right there beside them. So now it's our turn to have our voices heard in Congress, our state capitals, and I should have added in our city and county councils. Now, effective lobbying, it's an ongoing campaign with a series of planned actions where we want to be able to achieve our results. Get a bill introduced, get co-sponsors on a bill, get a bill passed, get the executive to sign the bill. So that means that our lobbying campaign has to be carefully planned, carefully researched, carefully executed. Lobbying is both an art and it's a science. Now, the art. The art of lobbying is turning no into maybe, turning maybe into yes, and turning yes into who. Can I help build support? The art of messaging. One of the things that we are going to need 
to always have, regardless of what our issue is, is we're going to need to have messaging that will resonate with whomever we are working to bring to our side. So when I was lobbying against a trade bill, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, I had two sets of talking points. One set was for Republicans. Republican legislators, they value freedom. They don't like corporate control. When I was talking to Democratic legislators, it was a totally different set of arguments. Most of the things that we support, there are a collection of ideas or messages that are inside that particular item. We need to make sure we have a feeling for what is a progressive argument, what is a conservative argument, and know who you're talking to. Now, here's one of the messages. I've got some Green New Deal folks here. Our Green New Deal Virginia Coalition proposes to create thousands of good jobs. Who's against creation of good jobs? There is no legislator that's going to say, oh, I'm against good jobs. Addressing the climate emergency, eh, some are going to say there's no climate emergency, and restoring Virginia's environment. They're all going to say they care about Virginia's environment. And our efforts will redress two of the biggest crises we face, climate change and inequity. That part of the statement helps people see that while this could be part of and is part of the climate movement, this is part of the climate movement that is looking not only at hugging trees, but it's also looking at uplifting and protecting people as part of a just transition. Just transition is one of those words that's designed to speak to people that are in dirty energy labor. We get it. This is your job. We are going to make sure that as we come up with clean energy, you will get trained in those clean energy jobs. And it also says to communities that frequently got coal ash, the waste and the garbage from the fossil fuel industry, we understand we're going to need to come back and clean up your community and get your air and your water safe to drink and safe to breathe. We are committed to putting justice at the forefront of our efforts. And then they have some really cool pictures. So if you have images that you can put on brochures or handouts where people see themselves and they go, oh, I didn't know about that before, but that is certainly something I can support. Who doesn't want clean air and water for a child? Nobody's going to say, oh, no, I think children should have dirty air. Virginia is a big agricultural state. So in the other image, we have a man who's a farmer and a veteran, and he's older and he's white. There's something in this for you. Everybody is a part of it. And if we have the ability to use imaging and images that show that, that's going to help build support across a lot of divides, age, race, um, and place. 
urban versus rural. Lobbying really is sales. And the number one rule of sales is people do things for their reasons, not yours. And I like the logo, Green New Deal, Virginia. Good jobs, good deal, good life. And then here's the whole thing all put together. You've got the words, you've got the images. I would work to make some of the people in the images a little more racially diverse. That's just me. I love the messaging. Now, one of the things that I'm the master of is the 30 second pitch. So it's very important, whatever level you're going to lobby on, know what the legislators look like. So when you see them at a farmer's market, in the elevator, walking back to their office from the bathroom, you can say, oh, Senator Warner, do you have 30 seconds? Normally they have 30 seconds. And they're going to say, no, I don't have 30 seconds. They, they've got 30 seconds. Now, in the 30 seconds, they're like, what are you going to do in 30 seconds? I'm dying to hear this. You're going to tell them your name. You're going to tell them the bill that you want them to support. You're going to tell them what it does and why they should be on it. I got at least 30 members of Congress on remove the ratification deadline for the Equal Rights Amendment by finding them in elevators, speaking loudly to their receptionist when I knew they were in their office. Um, I only need 30 seconds. And the members would get up and they would come to the door. What are you going to tell me in 30 seconds? You have 30 seconds right now. All right, let's look at the watch. And then I would make my pitch. And invariably, they would look at me, they would look at their staffer, and they would go, I'm not on that bill. If you were on that bill, I wouldn't be here. Why am I not on that bill? The 30 second pitch. If you know them, make your pitch. Now, the science of lobbying. I divide getting a bill passed into roughly six stages, and each stage has a different target and a different timeline. Number one, you are looking for a bill sponsor. You then are going to get initial co-sponsors. So when that bill is introduced, there's not just one person on it. Then you're going to be adding co-sponsors until that bill comes up for an actual floor vote where all the legislators are going to be able to vote on it. Um, and then after you successfully pass the bill in one chamber, then you're going to deal with crossover. Now, not all states and Congress doesn't really call it crossover. I actually like Virginia's term crossover because in reality, that really is what the bill is doing. It is crossing over from chamber A to chamber B. Now, normally in Congress, it's usually something goes from the House and then it goes to the Senate. But there are no rules that say it can't go from the upper chamber to the lower chamber. We see that more in the states than we do in Congress, but there is no rule against it. Stage one, finding the bill sponsor. Now, you have an idea for a piece of legislation and you've got some people that support it. You've got your bullet points for the bill, but you don't have a legislator to introduce it. You may even have a cool idea for a cool name for the bill. What you want to do is organize your talking points, get them written down, figure out that 30 second pitch. And then you're going to need to do some research. And we'll be talking about the tools you're going to use later on. 
who has sponsored a similar bill. Um, how many organizations support this bill? Are there any faith groups that support the bill? One of the things that legislators look at when you bring a faith group in as part of your coalition is who faith organizations have hundreds if not thousands of members so if you are statewide and one of your coalition partners is the unitarian universalist or the baptist they're immediately in their mind going oh my gosh there is a baptist church on every other corner so hmm, let me see is this any way that I can support this because they're going churches have members and their members vote. What groups are willing to help you build co-sponsors? If you're working in coalition, your other coalition partners should be out there helping you get more organizations and more individuals that are supporting this. If they aren't doing that, are they really a partner? Maybe they just loaned you your name and they said, well, if you get the bill introduced, then we'll help. All right, that's a good starting place. But with your partners, agree what does that partnership look like? Now, still on finding your champion, there may be, when you're doing your research, a number of legislators who have introduced similar bills in the past or even the current session, or they may have made statements about your issue, and you're going, wow, I bet they would be a great champion. Now, when you're looking for a champion and you've got several different possibilities, are they willing to help you promote the bill? And I should have added to the public, will they promote the bill to their colleagues? Okay, people get ready. Here's another story. When we were working on removing the ratification deadline from the Equal Rights Amendment, our original sponsor, Rob Andrews, had to suddenly leave Congress because of a scandal. And at that point, we had built a number of co-sponsors from 37, which is normally all we ever got, to 104. 100 co-sponsors is a huge milestone for a bill. Now, there were two paths forward on the Equal Rights Amendment. We could start over from scratch and basically scrap the 35 states that had, read, that had ratified, or we could remove the deadline, keep the 35 states, and try to add three more for the 38. Normally, 37 people on remove the deadline, 160 people on start over. So th that's where we were. So when we were looking at possible house co-sponsors, I suggested Representative Jackie Spear because Jackie Spear is a fighter. And when I went to talk to her about being the lead sponsor on this constitutional amendment, I said, we currently have 104 co-sponsors. We will be happy to go and bring those co-sponsors over to your new bill. And she was, I've got this. When she brought the bill out, she brought it out with 110. And we passed it a second time in February of 2021. Do the legislators work with legislators on the other side? That's really, really important to be able to get a bipartisan bill. We've got people on both sides of the aisle. And are they on a committee? that is going to hear this bill 
that will determine is the bill going to the floor. Jack T didn't sit on judiciary, but she was very friendly with a number of the people who did. Now, when the lead sponsor submits the bill, legislative services will make sure the bill meets constitutional muster and they will number the bill. And now your bill is official. At the federal level, it'll be an H bill. If it's in the House, it'll be an S bill. If it's in the Senate. In the states, it could be an H bill for the House or in California, it will be an A bill, meaning it's an assembly bill. You'll have a number and normally there will be a name or at least a description of what the bill does. Now, in Congress, if you've got a really good champion, they're going to write a dear colleague letter where they, as a member of the legislative body, ask their fellow legislators to support the bill. And then once you get this far, what kind of outreach to your supporters are you planning to do now that you've got a bill champion? So this could be time for petitions that let people know there's a bill that exists that addresses and does all the things that we have ever wanted a bill to do. Now, now you want to make sure that when that bill really does officially come out, there's not just one person on it. I mean, you can bring a bill out and just have the person who is championing it, that works. But it looks better, feels as though there's more support if there are other people that join them in bringing that bill into the legislative body. So you're going to go back to your research. Are there people, legislators, who supported similar bills in the past? They immediately go on your whip list. These are people that we want to talk to first. If there's a dear colleague letter, you can offer to help circulate the dear colleague letter. When you've got the draft language of the bill, talk to legislators and then tell them about the support for the bill. You can show them these are the organizations that are behind this bill. And then when the bill is finally introduced, all the initial co-sponsors will be listed on the bill. Now, in the states, you can bring a bill out with two, three um, initial co-sponsors, co-patrons, and that's just fine. At the federal level, the more co-sponsors at the introduction of a bill, the better that bill is going to be perceived by leadership and also other legislators. So now for a federal bill, if there are 100 co-sponsors, people go, wow, that bill is moving. On the Senate side, if there are 20 co-sponsors, again, the bill is moving. If the bill is bipartisan, people really get excited. And the same goes for state bills. It's just the numbers are a lot smaller. And really the big thing for state legislation is, is it possible to make it bipartisan? Or in Virginia, since the Dems are in the majority, whoever the majority party is, does the majority seem to favor that bill? And I'm just giving you a little sample of the For the People Act in the House. This is one of the legislative services that I use. It's called GovTrack. 
And so you can see the bill was introduced on January 4th. Um, it had already passed the House on March 3rd. And there were 222 co-sponsors, unfortunately all Democrats. Now in Congress, it's 218 people to pass a bill. So they had 222. Now, the bill was introduced in the Senate and on June 22nd, it failed cloture. What that means is there weren't enough senators that voted for it for them to begin real discussions of the bill. But the bill isn't dead. They didn't vote no on the bill. They voted that they weren't even willing to discuss it at this time. Now, stage three, you keep adding co-sponsors as long as the bill is waiting to get a vote. Has the bill been introduced in the other chamber? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. If you do have the bill in the other chamber, work to build co-sponsors in both chambers, or at least know who you want to introduce it in the other chamber. And can you use a committee hearing to build more support for the bill? Yes, this is being recorded. Yes, everybody who is here, you are going to get the recording. People are going, this is getting complicated. Once you've done it a couple of times, you realize it is very, very simple and very logical. Now, a committee hearing is normally a public thing. The public is going to be invited to give testimony for or against the bill. If your champion's party is in the majority, then you are really going to want to try to use that committee hearing to pull out all the stops and show massive support. Now, sometimes in committee hearings, they will tell you um, each group is only allowed to bring one person to testify. And that's if there are a lot of groups in support or opposition to the bill. It may also be that they just say, you know, we are going to be holding open testimony for a three hour period, whoever can get there, you can testify. So bring your supporters to give testimony in support of the bill. Make sure you know exactly what they are going to say. I have been in hearings where some of the people testifying, their testimony did more damage than it did good. Make sure you know what people you invite to give testimony are going to say. Know the opposition. What is the opposition going to say? Who are they probably going to bring? Are you prepared to counter their arguments with either organizations that represent more people or um, much and or much better arguments in support of? Now, when a bill is being heard in committee, this is one of the few times where every member on that committee is fair game for lobbying, whether you're a constituent or not. Let me repeat that. When a bill is in committee, every committee member can be lobbied on that bill because if the bill doesn't get out of committee, it's dead. So this is when people go to the Hill, they go to the office, district, capital, and this is now when we want to bring in the phone calls and the emails directly to the legislators. So they feel the pressure. Now, numbers. 
if you can get 10 people to call a congressional office on a bill, they have to write down everybody that called, whether they were for the bill or against it, then you've got their attention. In the state legislature, it's about four because people just don't call their state legislatures. Know who is for you, who is against you, and who is on the fence on that committee. If you can target more of the people that are on the fence and sway them to your side, the better. The people who are against you, it may not really be possible to sway them and to get them to vote for you. Now, here's another real world example. In Virginia, when we were working to ratify the Equal Rights Amendment, we always made it a point of having that bill be bipartisan, having Democrats and Republicans. One of our lead champions who was a Republican was Senator Jill Holtzman Vogel. And she was a very, very strong ally because several years before she had brought the um, ultrasound bill if women wanted to have an abortion. And because one of our main arguments is equality, equal rights for pay, job pay and access is not about abortion. She, as the author of that bill, saying, I get it, equal rights is really about exactly that. It's about financial empowerment, economic empowerment. It's about removing glass ceilings. She frequently was the vote that brought our bill out of the Senate committee when the Republicans were in charge of the Senate. So you are always looking to make your bills bipartisan and to have that strong voice where people go, well, she's really against abortion. And if she says it's not an abortion bill, then maybe it's not. All right. And then stage four, email, phone, lobby, the whole committee. There are tools that will allow you to choose all the committee members so that anybody who takes action, they are taking action on every member of the committee rather than just their one or two individual legislators. And I wanted to give you a picture. This is one of the tools that we use. It's called Ignite Advocacy. We can email members of the committee, either all of them or select ones. And then the same tool allows us to call committee members. And then there will be a script right below so that people can see this is what I should say. Anybody that, and I always feel really bad for groups where they send an email to people saying, hey, we need you to call your legislator, click here to look up their phone, to look up a, who your legislator is and to look up what their phone number is. And then we want you to say this. Well, number one, almost nobody does that. And number two, you have no way of knowing who did it. So why are you wasting everybody's time? when there are tools that you can use. People don't know who their federal legislators are and they certainly have no clue who their state legislators are. But what they do know is they know their name and they know their address. So give them a tool where they can enter that information and then it will say your legislators are. 
they may or may not learn who they are, but it's not important. The next time you need them to send a direct email, you're going to use that same tool and it will again figure out who their legislator is and get the email to the right person. I'm just going to interject really quickly. Yes. Sorry, Andrea. Someone asked what this tool is. It's called Ignite Advocacy. It is one that is rather expensive, but it, it's it is something expensive. where we can. It's yes. not rather. It's very. <laughs> it's it's very yes. And so it's not something that just anybody can have. That said, it is an unbranded tool, so we can, for example, create actions for you to use. Um, I will put my email in now and also later on at the end of the training. Um, but I just wanted to flag that this is something that we can share with you all. All right, great. And then the other tool, and there really will be a section on tools. The other tool is called Action Network. Um, Action Network isn't going to let you make phone calls, but it does allow you to email legislators. And Action Network, that function in Action Network is free. So I think everybody on this call, you can afford free. All right, now, the floor vote. Every member of the legislative chamber is entitled to vote on a bill when it goes to the floor. That's when you really want to have a tool that can allow you to do thank and spank advocacy, meaning all the legislators that are co-sponsors, you want to thank them for being a co-sponsor. Everybody that's not you may want to have one message to them, and then you may even want a third message to everybody who really should have co-sponsored but didn't. Action Network, which is free, is great at that. Now, when you are writing that email to people who have not yet supported the bill, do you know the counter arguments against a bill? And can you address those arguments in the email and either A, make them false or B, mitigate them? If you went over a single detractor, ask them to help you with the other legislators who are not yet supportive because they probably were supportive of one or two of those counter arguments. And now you have convinced them that either A, the counter arguments aren't really very important or B, what they were seeing as a counter argument was completely false. That, that's just not true. And now is the leadership of the political parties. Are they for you or are they against you? Nothing like having a great bill and party leadership hates it. I've resembled that remark several times. And are the whips for you or against you? People are going, what the heck is a whip? Well, every party and every caucus has a leadership team member assigned to rally members for or against a bill, and they are called the whip. Now, Il Ilhan Omar is the whip of the Congressional Progressive Caucus. Hank Johnson is the whip of the Congressional Black Caucus. And in Virginia, Alfonso Lopez is the Democratic whip. So whatever level you are lobbying, you are going to want to know where it's leadership and where are the whips. Because it's the job of the whips to rally their members around the leadership's position on the bill. And then stage six, crossover. Once you are successful, your bill has been voted out of committee, and now you have been successful on the floor vote, that bill is going to go over to the other chamber. And you get to start the process all over again in the other chamber. 
So hopefully there's already a bill sponsor that is either waiting to take up that bill that has passed or has been working on building support for the other chambers version of the bill. And then you now need to know what is the position of the executive, the president, the governor, the mayor, the head of city council. If you get the vote you want, will they allow that vote to stand or will they use the power of their pen and veto it? Quick little history on Virginia vetoes. When the executive vetoes the bill, the legislature, if there are a lot of people in support, they may vote to overturn the veto. A simple majority, which was enough to pass the bill in the first place, is never enough. You will always need a supermajority to override an executive veto. All right, now, Mark Warner, when he was governor, used his veto pen 18 times. Bob McDonald used his 20. Those are on the low end. The high end, George Allen, Jim Gilmore, and the record holder in all states, Terry McCollum. He used his veto pen 111 times to block legislation passed by the Virginia legislature. And most of the time, they did not have enough support because the numbers are so close to overturn that veto. All right, and what I'm going to do now is I'm going to stop sharing and I am going to be very happy to entertain questions on what I have covered so far. How is everybody doing? Are you liking it? Are you good? You can, you can go like that. You can use the reaction button, whatever it is that you want. So are you good? Are you learning a lot? Do you? Oh, yeah. People are going, oh, yeah. That's like, do you have questions? Uh, yes, Gwen. I'm curious, if we're dealing with a very difficult topic like child sex trafficking, what are your suggestions on getting a bill to pass utilizing, you know, trying to utilize um, testimonials, but in a way that is completely, you know, the person is not exposed. Uh, all right, number one. I cannot imagine a legislator anywhere in this country who is going to say, I'm for child sex trafficking. Right. So that legislator doesn't exist. So one of the things that you would be able to do is say, no one supports child sex trafficking. And I believe that would be a safe statement to make, other than the horrible people that are doing it. So as a legislator, it would be if they were not in supportive of this, that would be a cause to put them on blast. Senator, and I can't even think of even one that I would name, are you telling me that you support child sex trafficking? Do your constituents know? No, no, I, I'm not in support of child sex trafficking. Well, great, because then you, that means you support our position that child sex trafficking is not only wrong, it is abhorrent and immoral. And then I would hit them with a whole nice collection of adjectives where they're just going, right, right, right. And then they're picturing the little headline, XYZ supports child sex trafficking. 
I'm not getting, getting elected with that. So it's a difficult topic. And I would think that you would never use the names. You would only use maybe a generic location of where it happened and the age of the child. A six-year-old from Prince William County, a 10-year-old from Roanoke, and I would leave it at that. And then I would try to have maybe a witness from Southwest Virginia, Central Virginia, Northern Virginia, Hampton Roads, and North um, East Virginia. In other words, this is occurring all around the state. So you cannot say, oh, just because it didn't happen in my area, then I, I don't need to be worried about supporting your bill. If it is happening anywhere, it is equally wrong, it is equally immoral, it is equally devastating. You have a great issue. There is no possible moral stance that anyone can take for being against what you are trying to do. And anybody that does literally beat them up verbally and expose them. Thank you. But that's just me and I'm like that. I'm, I'm vindictive. <laughs> it's like, I'm gonna, you are gonna lose your job. I'm going to make sure I run you out of this legislative body. And I might need to have you arrested because if you are for it, I'm wondering why. Another question. To Sergeant Anthony. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, this um, greetings from Michigan City, Indiana. Uh, my name is Sergeant Anthony Edward Lewis, United States Army Infantry, retired. I um, Thank I've you, learned sir, a lot. For your service. Thank you. Um, learned a lot. Um, I think um, the most important thing I would say I learned from um this Zoom call is that um, it's important to know your audience. I, I completed training through Toastmasters. Knowing your audience is one of the things that's covered um, repeatedly. And um, I heard the, um, the expression used that, that rule of thumb turn um, a no into maybe, turn maybe into yes, turn yes into hell yes. And uh, that reminds me of, um, something I learned in the army. And that is you want to crawl, walk, run. The um, attitude I think most people have of lobbyists is not good. You know, you could say it's just a small notch above attorneys. And isn't it ironic that so many lobbyists are attorneys? The, um, the thing that has stayed in my mind as I've been listening to um, this entire discussion is this is our government. You have a right to be able to petition. Uh, what's the expression they have in the Constitution? Um, petition for redress. Right, death of grievances. See, everybody on this, everybody in this group knows where I was going with that. And so, in principle, you have the right to be able to speak to your member of Congress. But what is going to be the best way in which to be able to get their attention to get what you want? That is what lobbying is. You can get paid for it or you can do it as an individual citizen. The end result of the entire process is always gonna be the same. I think most of us may even be familiar with the Stanford study that shows you know, a good bill where everybody's behind it has as much chance of passing as a bad bill is frustrating. When you see you're dealing with a corrupted process, I uh, couldn't help but get very, very emotional as I was going through this training because I'm thinking about me personally. My, my big issue is the Voting Rights Act. I'm I have to be able to, you know, get those background voices to shut the hell up because they're screaming. You know, I'm I'm angry. But what has helped me push back against those negative voices? I'm not suffering from PTSD. Those negative voices 
is a reminder of the fact that, you know, what if it was you? What if you were that member of Congress? You know how many voices they're hearing? Which is the voice that they're going to hear and respond to? The way in which you're able to make sure that your member of Congress is going to hear your voice the loudest. This is what I heard during this training and I didn't put it together, but now it makes more sense. What did you say? Your best lobbyists are kids. Anybody here have kids? You know how annoying that crap is. You know, they, they, they know they, they got you. They know they got you. That's the reason why they keep coming at you over and over and over. And they're not trying to weaken your resolve as much as they're trying to remind you of your responsibility. And you can't, you can't say no to that. You got to do something. Even if it's not what it is they're asking for, you got to do something. And that is in line with the process I heard turn no into baby, turn maybe into yes. Turn And who, oh, you, see, you can actually start with the presumption. They always want to say yes. Now, who wants to say no? What are you saying no to? You're saying no to yourself? The process, even if it's been corrupted and gotten complicated, it is still expected to be accountable. You call your senator, guess what? It's recorded. You get in, uh, I, I had a chance years ago when I was lobbying for uh, supporting the troops. You might recall back in 2007, I had had a break in service at that time. I actually went to Washington as a part of a lobbying junket to try to fund the military because they were trying to cancel the war that Biden is now actually going to get us out of. What year is this? Back in 2007, Congress had made a decision, Bush, you can't get us into this never ending war. We got to get out. You know what's a way to get out? Don't pay soldiers. Anybody remember? You had talked about the moral I high ground. remember that one, yeah. You remember yeah. that? Yeah. I'll never forget yeah. it. And they're not there because, you know, they didn't have anything better to do this summer. They were ordered to go there with their lives. And now after you send them there, you're going to Wait, not you pay, them. pay them. Yes, yes. Does anybody remember that? What was, what was the moral okay, argument? Yeah. Anthony, oh, yeah. Anthony, 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 whoa. You and I need to talk. All right. So, yeah, you and I need to talk. Um, did you register? I don't understand that. What that means? Uh, did you register, or someone just sent you the link? You if just, you registered, I've got your email address, and I can reach out to you. Let me. Um, uh, I, I believe I registered. I, I, I'll I'll make sure my email. Address right. Is in Otherwise, it. John, do a private chat to me and send me your email address. John, you and I need to talk. All right. Uh, please, please call uh, me Sergeant. I, I, uh, <laughs> sorry, Sergeant Anthony. I love your passion, and I love the fact that you are in Indiana. Do you realize how hard it is for us to find people outside of the big progressive hubs to do any lobbying at all? You and I may become newest, bestest friends. That's so, <laughs> yeah. So we are going to talk. So uh, let me see if I've got other folks now yeah. because I've got more material and I want to end on time. But you and I, we need to talk. As a matter right. of fact here, I'm going to put my email for everybody right there in the chat. You can email me at andrea at centerforcommonground.org. So, Sergeant Anthony, thank you. Do we have any? Yeah, I got it. Do we have, and I'm saving the chat. Uh, do we have any other questions on what I've covered so far? Because now I'm going to talk about what you're going to do when you are getting ready to go in the office or have your conversation over Zoom. A lot of us are still lobbying over Zoom. And then we're also going to talk about the tools. All right. Are we good, Josie? All right. Here we go. We're back. All right. Your lobby group. Lobbying is not a protest. Do not bring 40 people to a lobby visit. Don't go there. Show numbers in the field. You can be protesting outside the office. Now that works. And then you have a small group that goes in the office, three 
to five people. It's really great if your group can be diverse. If it's not diverse, it is what it is, but it's great if it can be diverse. And then you want to have one expert on the bill so that if the staffer or the legislator has a question, you will be able to answer it. And then it's great if you can have at least one constituent of the legislator. That is really easy to do when you're doing a lobby over Zoom because people don't need to travel. And if they are far away, then they can still be part of your lobby visit. Now, handouts. Do not, let me repeat this, do not capital N, capital O, capital T, ever deliberately go and visit a legislative office with nothing in your hand, clearly explaining why you were there. Because if you do that, you weren't there. Now, if possible, if you are an organization and you've got letterhead, put your demands on letterhead. If there are other organizations that have given you permission because they've all signed off on the letter, put their logos somewhere on the letter as well. So that the moment they look at that leave behind, it wasn't just you, one lone little individual, it was you and a bunch of people from all these other organizations. That is who they are saying no to. And believe me, they're counting votes. Mm. So how your recommendations can bring in vote and appeal to voters' concerns. When I was doing lobby training earlier and our folks were going out to lobby their local legislators in district, their letters always began as voters in your district because there might be a small group of people that would go to visit their legislator, but there was a whole collection of people behind them that agreed. Now, we have the handout and then on the day of the lobby, get those emails and calls starting to come in. Mention current and past legislation that your legislator has supported in the past. So if they've been on other similar bills, remind them this is very similar in the past you supported HR 2560, which did da 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 da. -da. And we've now updated and added. And then make sure the staffers have the actual talking points that can be used to persuade other legislators. Just as you know other activists, staffers know other staffers. And what do they talk about? They talk about who they met with. I had this incredible group come to see me today and they were talking to me about sustainable jobs in the Green New Deal. Yes, I know that labor, I was under the impression that labor really wouldn't like the Green New Deal because it was going to take away their jobs. Labor is signing on to this in a big way because they want clean energy jobs and job training so that they can continue making a good wage, but they're not damaging their community or anybody else's community, and they're not risking their own health. That would be novel. Now, online tools, and we're going to give you a couple of demonstrations. If you want to do federal lobbying, these are free tools that you can use.
you can use congress.gov. That is the official federal website. When all bills are introduced, they end up on congress.gov. Uh, there's a tool called Popbox. Um, I like it and I like the way it displays who the legislators are who are in support of a bill. My personal fave is govtrack.us um, because A, the way that it looks and the instantaneous picture it gives me of what is going on with this piece of legislation. And then track bill is one of the tools that is part of our federal tool set where with track bill and now um, we have the ability to see every bill introduced in all 50 states and US Congress. Now, the free version of track bill allows anyone to search for bills and it searches across all 50 states and Congress. What the paid version does, which is what we have, is it allows us to track that bill and then get notified when there's a committee hearing on the bill. So that really is going to be the difference between what we can do and what you'll be able to do for free. Track bill is an app that runs on your phone, either Android or iPhone. If you're doing state work, track bill is federal and state, which is why I love track bill. Congress pop box and gov track are federal only. And then whatever state you're in, they will have a state legislative service that will show you every member of the legislature, every bill that's introduced, who introduced it, and who is co-sponsoring it. Now, I'm going to go through this fairly quickly because I've created a lobbying training 202, which will be how do you use these tools? Congress.gov is ugly. It's filled with information, but they've made no attempts at making it attractive. It's utilitarian. So here's a bill, HR1, the For the People Act. And when you find your bill, notice it says the bill has been introduced. It passed the House. It tells you there have been eight votes on it. And then there have been 84 actions around it, nine amendments, 222 co-sponsors, and it has gone through 11 committees and there are 53 related bills. So if what you are doing has anything to do with voting rights, gerrymandering, redistricting, campaign finance, I would immediately be going to congress.gov and taking a glance at those 53 related bills. Now, this one is my preference because of the way it looks. This is GovTrack. All right, I admit, I, I like pretty. I fall, fall for the pretty face. You come to the bill on the overview. There is a tab where you can see who are all the co-sponsors. And then you can go into details and find out what similar bills are there to this. And there's kind of a study guide and you can read the actual bill. The presentation is easier. Now, I'm also rather fond of pop votes. This is the Senate version of the For the People Act. So what I like about Popbox is the moment I get to my bill, it immediately shows me, here's the person who introduced it and when they introduced it, and here are all the people that currently are co-sponsors of the bill. And when I'm actually on Popbox, 
I can go and click on that individual and then look at other things that they have sponsored. So again, I do research. What's the bill? Who's on it? What else have they sponsored? Because I'm not going to just be lobbying on one bill or one topic. I'm going to be lobbying on several. So I am always looking for those other possible legislative contacts. Now, this is track bill. This is the one that will be free. You just can't track the bill for your phone or your computer and all 50 states and Congress. Right now, when you first go to a bill, you're looking at the bill summary. All right. Remember, there were 222 sponsors. They're there. This says there were 10 amendments and nine committees actually held hearings on the bill and had a vote. And there were 69 actions that took place on the bill. You will not have this toolbar stuff on the bottom. That is the only thing that you won't have. You will have all this table of content stuff that will be there for you. And remember, it's free. Now, if we were looking at state legislation, I brought up a Virginia bill. This is track bill with a Virginia bill. So I can look at, here's a summary of the bill that passed. There are other options. The bill that passed and the bill that was introduced because there were amendments, it's not the same thing. I can look at who voted for the bill in all the different votes that they took. I can also look at what committees it went through and who voted for or against the bill in committee. This is tremendous information that you will need for further lobbying in the other chamber if you need to do that or lobbying for legislation that may be similar. This is Richmond sunlight. I like Richmond sunlight because it immediately shows me the co-patrons of the bill with a link. It's a hot link directly to all of my co-patrons. So this is the same, uh, it's not really the same bill, it's sort of a similar bill um, on Richmond Sunlight. And then this is the Virginia Legislative Information Service. Every state has their own version of LIS. When you go to your state's version, what they are going to show you is where is the bill now? So this bill was introduced in January. Um, the House made some changes. Their substitute was printed on the 14th. The bill passed the House and it passed the Senate. And on March 24th, the governor signed it. So I get an immediate view. Where is this bill now? So I normally consult all three services when I am building my whip list if the bill had not already passed and figuring out where and to whom do I go next? Information, information, information. And of course, the LIS service is free. Now, putting your lobbying campaign together. Number one, what are you trying to achieve? Well, do you believe that in your first time out, 
you are going to pass the bill. Maybe you believe that, maybe you don't. Maybe you have a goal to get 25 or 50 legislators to co-sponsor it. Know what your goal is. I sometimes call this, know what winning looks like. Target, who can give you what you want? When you go and see legislators, legislators have the ability to vote on bills, to introduce legislation, to co-sponsor legislation, and to vote on legislation. If you need something else, it's possible you don't need to be talking to a legislator because that is what legislators do. They're very limited. Tactics. How can you influence this person? Will rallies outside their office influence them? Rallies in the street? Will hundreds of emails pouring into their office and phone calls tying up their staff, will that influence them? And are you working against any upcoming deadlines? The crossover deadline, any bill that has not passed one chamber, that crossover deadline is X. Do you know of any personal stance that the legislators you are targeting have on this legislation? And who is your opposition? Meaning, do they have a lot of money or are you really working to organize against other grassroots groups? It kind of makes a difference. Now, now that you've done all the research, you know all the offices you're going to want to go and see, now it's time to set up the meeting. You can make an official request in writing and follow up with a phone call. We request in a meeting with your office. Um, we have several constituents that will be joining us. I just want to follow up and see, is there a date available yet? Generally, when you make the phone call and there is a constituent with them, they will come up with a date. You um, always hope to meet with a legislator. 90% of the time, it is going to be a staffer. If you're lucky, you're going to encounter the legislator. Have your, nine, have your 30 second pitch ready. Now, are you going to meet in their capital office? Are you going to meet in their district office? Probably should have added, or are you going to meet on Zoom? Which means, your experts don't necessarily have to live in your district. It will be easier for you to get outside experts. Remember, you don't have big money to pay outside experts. You've got to get them to join from wherever they are. And you've already been collecting your broad base of support. Mr. Legislator, we have 300 people who have already signed a petition saying they support whatever your issue is. Now, here's the biggie, who should it end? Three to five people is ideal and present a diverse constituency so that when the staff walks in, they're like, ooh, We've got young people, we've got community of color folks, we've got older folks, um, we've got, oh, we've got a veteran. Okay, so there seems just from that first impression of your lobby group, a broad base of support. Be respectful, be early, look presentable. Um, these folks are attorney lobbyists. So of course they all look like attorneys. In my original slide, I showed people casually dressed. No, you do not go on a lobby visit in sandals and ripped shorts, no. But you also don't need to go in a suit and tie. In the old days, when I first started lobbying and I was younger and my feet didn't hurt nearly as badly as they do now, I always looked great. 
I wore the suit. I wore the heels. Now, I'm just not wearing sandals. But after that, anything goes. I'm old. I'm tired. I'm mean. I project that. It works for me. And then if you have the opportunity, practice and role play so that you know what you want to say, you're not rambling, and you can go straight to the point when you get in that meeting. Lobby team roles are like, there's more. Yes, there's more. If you have a group of, say, this is for a group of five people, who's the facilitator? Who's going to say, thank you for meeting with us, whatever the staffer's name is. And they will introduce the people who are in the room, making a point of identifying anyone who is a constituent. Now, a storyteller. One, maybe two, these are people who are impacted by this legislation and this legislation could and will make a difference in your lives. Gwen, because you are dealing with child sex trafficking, there will not be children um, unless you have the most extraordinary child in the world capable of staring an adult in the face and telling their story without reliving the trauma. Um, normally, you would have your adult experts, maybe a social worker who has worked with a family who has been victimized possibly a parent, again, if they can deal with the trauma and they're able to speak. Otherwise, maybe they want to just write a letter than showing up in person. Now, the asker, that's a tricky one. You want a person who is not going to beat around the bush, who is going to make the direct ask. Is this something you think your boss can support? And there doesn't need to be a whole long wind up to that. You've already done the wind up. Is this something you think your boss can support? Staff first cannot speak for their boss. They can say, well, they supported bills like this in the past, or they have never supported a bill like this. If you've got a legislator in the hot seat, well, senator, whomever, are you in or are you out? Can I count on you to become a co-sponsor of this bill today? And then shut up. Make them say yes or no. People are going, boy, the silence in this room is getting really, really tense. And you sit there and you wait for that answer. Right? That's one of the toughest things to do when you're lobbying. When you hit that direct question and then you are waiting for that answer. And other people are going to want. Stop. That person, legislator, they're on the spot. Now, the educator, they're probably going to be the one that hands the staffer or the legislator your one page document. Don't bring a book. Well, if you want to give them a book as a gift, that's one thing. But when you're talking about your legislation, it needs to be one page, front and back. We don't want people fumbling with staples. If it's really, really complex, like the Virginia Green New Deal, different people are going to come back and hit them with different options. Keep it on one page so that the whole thing remains together. Staffers will not take something to their boss if they realize, oh, I lost a page. They're going to keep looking for that lost page. If it's only on one page, nothing for them to lose. They got that page got the whole deal. And then there's going to be that 
person who collects all the business cards of the staff or sometimes there's more than one and they have that information and they write it down they take notes and then they will be responsible for the follow-up all right now meetings are quick introductions two minutes your name, your city. We don't need to know how many children you have in your background or any of that. It's not relative. Your name and your city, especially if you are a constituent. Why we are here. We have collected 300 petition signatures on X. And now you're going to go into the facts. Two minutes and then story time. We have two of your constituents who have been impacted Seriously, Mike Olash, boom, go. All right, now, they know who you are. They figured out who's a constituent. They're seeing the petitions. They know you are not alone in supporting whatever this idea is. And now it's time to fish your cut bait. Mr. Legislator, Ms. Legislator, will you support our bill, blah, 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 today? Well, you've presented some really compelling arguments. Um, I may need to do further study. Children are being sex trafficked right now. Do we need to tell your fellow citizens that you support child sex trafficking? Is that what we're supposed to take from this meeting? Uh, no, no, no. People are laughing. Hey, I've been in meetings like that. That wasn't the topic, but I have been in meetings like that. And then when you get their answer, uh, wrap up and say, thank you. And then when you do a debrief with your group, get out of their office. I have seen groups debrief right in the office. And I'm like, are you people insane? Go out the door, debrief in the hall. That's why God made the hall, go out in the hall. And then finally, what you're going to do in the end, oh, sorry, I've got lobby meeting dues. Engage the staffer. If you can get a staffer to smile at you, and they're not just, all right, yeah, my boss made me take this meeting because there's a bunch of constituents. If you can get them to smile, you've got them. All they have to do is smile. You don't even have to get a laugh. You just need to get them to break a smile. Pause it for each main point. You wanna make sure they get it. Ask if they've got any questions. If there's anything that was in your bill um, that's complicated then or controversial, then restate it and why you are making this non-controversial and why there is huge support for what you've just asked them for. I've already gone through the ask. Straight to the point, ask the question, be silent, wait for the answer. And again, if they say yes, great. Thank you so very much. Who else would you suggest that we talk to? Will you make a call and let them know we're coming? Have you heard from the opposition? What is the opposition telling you? Because again, the opposition is either A, spoken to the legislator, or they've spoken to the staffer. They know, and then follow-up questions. If they say no, what's it going to take for you to support this, and what's holding you back? I really can't believe that you support child sex trafficking. What on earth could be stopping you from supporting a bill that is really going to crack down on people who are trafficking and harming children? Oh, and see now that that's going to make them rethink their life a little bit. And then following up, thank them, send a written note to their office, build support, get more people going, let people know you had the meeting, especially your organizational partners, stay in touch, keep the relationship alive. Um, Mo Brooks, Alabama Republican. We went to his office every month for 13 months. They were on our list of 
people we wanted to irritate just because. We knew a lot of the things we went to talk to them about. They were never, ever going to let alone vote for it or even co-sponsor it. Finally, 14th time, we came back and we wanted them to oppose the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And what the staff told Rick is he said, you have been in here every single month. He said, generally the things that you are talking about, we don't support that. We're never gonna support that. But this, this one thing, thank you for continuing to come back to our office with this. We are with you on this. And then immediately, thank you very much. Um, are there other members of the Alabama delegation that we can talk to? And he was like, yeah, go talk to the ding and the ding and the ding, tell them I sent you. And if you've got time, there's the guy in Tennessee, we play tennis together, go talk to him, tell him that this is something that we feel very, very strongly for. And we finally found common ground, which is one of the really weird reasons we named our organization Center for Common Ground. And then the thank you letter, um, you can email it, summarize your key talking points, and what do they get? What's their benefit? This is a sample letter where they have pictures. We like the little deer, happy, smiling people. This is really nice. Maybe you just have logos on it, but send a thank you letter. And then now that you've done the meeting and you've met with a number of offices, you're getting ready for a committee vote or maybe a floor vote, time for more letters, petitions, calls, more meetings, capital lobby days, indirect pressure, letters to the editor. Now more people in the community are aware that this is a thing. Um, paid media, press conferences, the NAACP is great with press conferences, visibility, protest, picketing, lit drops, what's a lit drop? When you have a new piece of literature and you don't even want to visit the staffer, you just go from office to office, dropping off the piece of literature for the appropriate staffer and you keep on building your coalition. All right, how are we doing on time? I've got about 10 more minutes. So I run big lobby visits. Um, sometimes when I'm on Capitol Hill, I will have a small group of seven. Other times I may have a group of 40. If it's a big annual lobby day and we've had people come in from other states. Normally, I have a letter written for every legislator we are going to visit. And on that letter, I have their name, I have their office location, so people know where to go. Now, Congress is actually three buildings. So normally, I separate my letters by building so that when I give a team a set of letters, they may have a letter where they're the constituent, but then all the other letters keep them in the building and they stop at the top, start at the top floor and work their way down to the ground. Now, when you were going, if you were going on your own, you're probably not going to be planning initially these big giant office visits. There are free apps. You can have Congress that only works on Android. And I've got a sample of what the Congress application looks like. And that tells you that if you were going to go see Jackie Spear, she is in the Rayburn building in office 2465. So in other words, it's the third building in Congress, they count zero instead of one, they start at zero. 
Rayburn is the third building and she's on the fourth floor in room 65. That's how you read that. All right. So if you get referred to another office, pull out your Congress app, go to the state, find that legislator, click their name, and it will tell you exactly where their office is. And meanwhile, while you're there, you can click on bills. What bills have they introduced? That will all be there right there in your palm. I can generally tell staffers what bills people are on quicker than they can look it up on their congressional system. I'm like, oh, right, yeah, I see. They were on blah, 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 blah. blah. Like, How did you do that? That's like, okay. And again, if you're in a state legislature or you have an Android phone, you'll be on track bill. Looks a little different, but it's free and has the same information. All right, Josie, I'm going to let you share your screen because now we're talking about a flash or a street lobby. I don't do very many of these anymore, but what we would do in D.C. or in the state legislature, this can work really, really well, is you ask people, do they know about such and such, and would they be willing to call their legislator, and you've got a script all prepared for them right here, right now. So Josie, I'm going to release my screen and let you take over to pop up and ignite advocacy. Alrighty, so I have one of our ignite advocacy alerts pulled up. This is a very general one that goes to all of your US senators. Um, so anybody in the country can use this tool is asking them to support the For the People Act and reform the filibuster. So if I am, I get this link and I wanna take action. So let me just finish pulling up my address. Oops, I can type. That's when I use me at here.com. That is very smart, well, you know. This way you can see my email again in case you need it. Um, so now that I've chosen to take action, and this again is to my US senators, I have a few ways that I can contact them. So one of a really quick way is if you have a Twitter, I can tweet at both of my senators. If I want to send them an email, there is already an email written out for me here. All I have to do is click send email. Um, and I also want to call them. So here are two phone numbers for me and another script that I can use to call both of my Virginia senators with the ask that they pass the For the People Act and support at least amending the filibuster so it can actually make it through the Senate. Um, this is a great tool for state and federal actions and bills. Um, again, this is something that is unbranded so we can help you create actions if you want to use one um, and you can even make a short custom url so it's really easy for anybody to just type it in their phone and take action and it's really effective in georgia we sent over 52,000 e emails and made tons of calls um, into state reps offices especially when it was time to target committees and it really you know kept a lot of bills from making out of committee and the one that did become law is not even close to what it was before um, because of using alerts like this. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now. Leave it up, leave it up, leave it up. Now, okay. when I would do a street lobby or a flash lobby, um, if I'm in Virginia, like let's say I'm down uh, around the Richmond State House. Everybody going in there is probably from Virginia. So I would just have it on the call side. So because you know our federal senators are the same for everybody that lives in the state, would you be willing to call Senator Warner and tell Senator Warner that we need to reform the filibuster? How do I do that? Well, I've got a little script right here and as soon as you push that button, you're going to get connected to the senator's office, talk to the staffer and or leave a message. 
and that's a flash for a street lobby. So you've got like three people out there with phones. Um, I normally keep a couple of burner phones so that if somebody walks off with it, my life as I know it is not over. You know, that's just me. Mm -hmm. That's what we do. All right, yeah. now you can stop sharing your screen. Oh yeah, people are enjoying the animation. That's great. And I am going to be wrapping up very, very shortly. So that was the flash for Street Lobby. I decided I need and a Lobby 202, we're going to actually teach people how to and I'll go get your own accounts. We will teach you how to write for that's something that Josie runs. That's a $30,000 tool. So, all right, there we are. So Action Network will allow you to email your federal or your state officers, or if it's city and county, anybody that you can get their email address, you can send them emails with Action Network. Ignite Advocacy, that is our special tool that allows you to email we call. As Josie said, it is unbranded. So if you've got a need to reach out to your state legislators, or maybe it's a federal issue, as long as this is something that basically we support, then we will teach you how to write for us so we can build what you want in Ignite Advocacy. And this thing goes for new mode. New mode is kind of sort of like Ignite Advocacy. The big difference is it supports catch through calling. I was doing a lot of work around social security and a number of our folks said, you know, we don't have long distance on our phones. We really can't afford to call Washington, D.C. So I got new mode so that we could put up a phone advocacy. People would put in their phone number and then our system would call them and then patch them through to their legislator and we would pay for the call. So depending upon who your constituency group is, you can talk to us about putting a new mode patch through call system together. And each one of those tools is designed so that when people get it, they know their name, they know their street address. And based on those two things, these tools can automatically find their legislators or all the members of a committee where we can then email, tweet, or call as many members of the committee as we want. All right, next screen. Now, as I mentioned, on August 14th at 4 p.m. Eastern so that our West Coast folks can actually show up. Um, people are going seven o'clock in the morning. I haven't even had my first cup of coffee, let alone my second. All right, I scheduled one later. What we're going to be doing is working with you on what tool to deploy when. All right, so do you need patch through calls or direct calls? And we're going to make sure you know how to write up whatever it is that you need for us so that we can roll that out for you. And then we'll collect email addresses, probably some phone numbers. And if you want those, you've got your own mailing list. We can provide those for you. All right, um, that's it. All right, 
Are we good? Thank you so very much for joining. I was really determined to finish on time. If there are any other questions that anybody has, I've got a few minutes. I will be very happy to answer your question. Gwen. Thank you again so much for everything. This is absolutely amazing. Um, two quick questions. When telling our own story, um, which I heard from Josie, that's okay to do, um, especially in the area of child trafficking. Um, my other question is then, like, if you like, what do you want to share? What do you not want to share? And then secondly, I like to do my research on people that I'm meeting with. If we make it it personal and like, you know, Senator Warner, um, you know, what if your granddaughter, Amy, was put in that position? Is that too much to make it that kind of personal? No. Okay. No, no. They periodically have to be reminded, you're us. You are not a separate species. You have money. You have power. But you are just as vulnerable to something like that as we are. And that kind of helps them go, whoa, I never thought about it like that. Yes. Thank you. Yes, they are just like us. They just add the money, the power, and the knowledge to get themselves elected. Neoma, darling, did you learn some things? Thank you very much. You are very, very welcome. Very welcome. Everybody who was here, everybody who signed up, you will be able to get a copy of this video and you will get the presentation that I used. You will have that. All right. And a lobby toolkit. That might come a little later, but we're making a lobby toolkit that you all can use with some sample emails and stuff like that with general scripts and then voting rights specific scripts. But that oh, well, is all and thank you, coming. Thank you, Josie, for that corporate we. That is Josie who is working on the lobby. <laughs> and we'll probably Josie and maybe just. <laughs> I'm right. going to just approve the lobby toolkit. That's my job. I approve. I don't make anything anymore. So it's like, let's be honest. All right. Are we good? Are you feeling powerful and empowered? I love it when I create more citizen lobbyists who will be able to go out and we change the world. The world would be a very different place if we left everything solely to our legislators. I want to see hundreds, if not thousands of us going out and demanding. Um, our 501c4 is called people demanding action. It's not people begging for action or people hoping that there might be action. It's people demanding action which is our right as people who live here. The electeds are spending our tax dollars for their salaries. They need to listen to their bosses. Some of them have gotten a little confused as to who is the boss of whom. So with that, I'm going to say thank you. I just had the best time. Take care. Have a marvelous afternoon. Bye. Bye, everybody. Thank you.